when I was about 20 years old, so about 6 years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid-afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired due to him losing his license because of a DUI, I was placed on the night shift, since my boss hired a family friend who could only work my shift for whatever reason. I didn't really want this shift, because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss was an asshole, and essentially told me if I wasn't willing to work the night shift, I'd be fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly agreed to work the shift. The first month of this shift went by without any issues, until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it in on my GPS and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive, and it's about 11 p.m. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses, but the house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait another 30 seconds, but still nothing. I'm standing there getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down, but thankfully a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late forties. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over six foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here, and he just stands there staring at me. I asked him if he was okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, sorry. I got off work not too long ago, and I'm zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money, I hand him the pizza, and as I'm making change, he says, You're really beautiful, you know that? Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight, and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order for the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time and ring the doorbell. He enters the door very excitedly. Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and couldn't wait to go home, to which he chuckled and said that he knew that feeling pretty well. As he's counting his money, he asks me what my name is. Being kind of tired at this point and not really thinking straight, I stupidly tell him the truth. As I'm making change, he asks if he could have my number, as he'd love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. Hold up, buddy. Pump the brakes. I've literally only met this guy twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is that I look way younger than I was at the time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked like I was 15. I was just hoping he thought differently, and wasn't hitting on someone he thought was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds before I muster up that I have a boyfriend. He gets a little upset. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night and walk back to my car. He says nothing and just stands in the doorway, staring at me until he finally goes back inside once I start my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy and even brought it up to my co-workers, and they agreed it was pretty spooky. All except for my boss, who overheard everything, and claimed I was making up stories and trying to gain sympathy for having to take the shift. A week later, as I'm working the night shift, we get an order from the same guy again, and this is when shit finally hits the fan. I arrive at the house at around 10.30pm, and keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in the house was on. I get out of my car, and I walk to the front door with the pizza box in my arms. As I'm approaching, it swings open to reveal the man, except this time he was wearing a suit. I jump back a little bit. Sorry I scared you. I saw you out the window and figured I'd just open the door now so that you didn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because, as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in the house, so we were sitting in the dark this whole time. And if so, why? 
I make a nervous laugh and say that it's okay. He asks me if I like his suit, to which I say yes. Would you like to go on a date with me tonight? What the fuck? I once again tell him I have a boyfriend, to which he chuckles, gets close to me, and says, Honey, there's no way a girl your age is on a serious relationship. If you go on a date with me, I'll show you how a real man treats a girl. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side, and grabs my arms hard. I'm officially shitting bricks at this point, and trying not to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him. Dude, please, I just want to go home. I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I've seen on someone's face. I don't care. Get inside now. We're gonna have a good time. He starts trying to pull me into the house, and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling, he lets go of one of my arms and starts grabbing something out of his pocket, which I presume is a knife. I did something that to this day I'm still thankful worked as he was doing that. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in his stomach. This stuns him for a few seconds, and he loosened his grip on me, allowing me to break free. I quickly run to my car, and as I get in, he runs at me and tries pulling me out, holding the knife with the other arm. He even yells, Why are you making this so difficult? I grab the half-empty soda bottle I had in the cup holder, and throw it. Luckily it hits him right in the face, and he lets me go. I slam the door when all of a sudden he jumps right on the hood of my car and starts scratching and banging on my windshield with his knife. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot, reversing down the road with him desperately trying to hold onto my car. He's banging on my hood, screaming and yelling at me to stop the fucking car. I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible and luckily he falls off of the hood. I slammed the gas as hard as I could to get as far away from that sick bastard as fast as possible. I'm in a panic state. I drove a couple of blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks in fear that I was being followed. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat at the intersection, frozen from what had just happened. I began crying and violently shaking as I was sitting there. It dawned on me that I came so close to losing my life, and I couldn't help but feel like I shouldn't have been alive. Once the light turned green, I pulled over to the side and just sat there crying. Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria, and almost immediately after I walk in, my coworker knew something was wrong after seeing me. I practically broke down in front of him, and everyone else came to the front wondering what was going on. I fought back my tears and explained everything that had just happened. My coworker comforted me, and my boss surprised me and began apologizing profusely for what had happened and for putting me on the night shift in the first place. He took me into the office and handed me the phone to call the police. They arrive at the store and I give them my statement, as well as taking pictures of any marks on myself, as well as scratches on my car from the encounter as evidence. My coworker followed behind me as I drove home, and I collapsed on my bed. Strangely enough, I somehow managed to fall asleep. I quit the job the next day, and luckily a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later I receive an update from the police. The entire duplex is owned by the guy's brother, who lived on the right side with his wife, and the psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly at first for robberies and assaults, but later on it was for sex crimes. He had been released from jail about five months prior to this encounter for having sex with the minor. When they arrived at the house he was long gone, and his family had no idea where he'd run off to, but the police insisted they would find him. And indeed they did, albeit not alive. I spent the next two months in fear that he would find me and finish what he had in mind, but the police contacted me and updated me on the case. Apparently he'd fled to another city nearby and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone at night on the street. Luckily someone happened to be looking out the window at the right time, called the cops, and the police caught him trying to force her into his car. He managed to flee and the police chased after him. 
He blew a red light near a busy boulevard, and a van slammed right into the driver's side of his car. And by some sort of miracle, the driver of the van only sustained minor injuries, while the psycho succumbed to his wounds long before the ambulance even got there. I thanked the officers for everything they did, and for informing me as I walked out of the station. I walked down the street, and I light up a cigarette as I'm taking in everything I had just been told. I don't wish death on anyone, but after hearing about his, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I would never have to encounter him again, and that I wouldn't have to go through with charging him and reliving what happened that night. My last experience two years before this was scary, but I think this one takes the cake as being the scariest, as I was alone face to face with the psycho. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me into his house. When I was 18, I got a job at Walmart. Small town, so not much else there for someone fresh out of high school. I'd been there about a month and worked in the jewelry department, usually from mid-afternoon until the department closed at 9pm, and I would close the department myself. But obviously, Walmart is open 24 hours, so other people were always around. One night, I'm locking the cases up and putting things away, and an overnight stalker walks by and says hi. I look up and smile and say hi back, then go about my business. This guy. The only way I can describe him is to say he looks like one of the Bee Gees. Shoulder length frizzy hair, kind of a bouncy hop in his step when he walked. Mid fifties. This started to become a regular thing. On nights I closed by myself, he'd walk by and say hi and I would say hi back. That's it. No conversations ever took place. And then on my birthday, a few of my friends who worked there got me a cake, and I hugged them and said thank you. About an hour later, Mr. Bee Gees comes around with a birthday card and gave it to my manager to give to me. The manager thought it was extremely funny that this weirdo got me a card until I opened it. Happy birthday! I saw you hugging those guys earlier. It made me really mad, but I called a friend and talked it out and he made me realize you're allowed to have other friends than me. Just please don't hug them anymore. Save those hugs for me. I don't know what kind of emotion showed on my face, but my manager grabbed the card and read it, then walked me back to the store manager's office and showed it to him. Store manager said the guy was obviously joking, but that he would talk to him about it. I didn't see Mr. Bee Gees for about a week, until one night while I was closing, he plunked down a stuffed envelope on my counter as he walked by without saying a word. Inside, it was six pages front to back of pure crazy. It was basically his entire life story, all about his family and the schools he went to, but with weird stuff like how his sister was a psychic and his father was an exorcist and all sorts of weirdness. The end of the letter was about how his friend who was 18 months old was missing and he knew she was being raped because he could hear her screaming his name in his dreams. So that also went to the store manager, and he had me write a written complaint. He told me not to go outside by myself, and not to wander near where the guy might be while I'm on my breaks. Ah, uh, no, just get rid of him. Two nights later, I was finishing up for the night, and the way the counter is set up, there's one opening and the counters go all the way around both sides. He brought a handcart around with boxes from my department, but pushed it into the only opening in the counter so I was trapped inside. He just stood there and stared at me, while I looked at him with what I'm sure was terror. I was then, and still am, now riddled with anxiety. I don't like confrontation, and the last thing I wanted was for this weirdo to confront me about me reporting him twice. He whispers, Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I turned around and started finishing my closing tasks, pretending he wasn't even there, though I could feel him staring at me. After a few minutes, I just looked at him and said, Weren't you told to stay away from me? He gave me this gross predator grin and said, The store manager asked me if I was joking. I told him I was. Then he leaned in as close to me as he could get with the counter between us and whispered, But I'm not joking. And then he walked away. 
For two weeks after that, he would randomly show up wherever I was. I would leave for lunch and he would be there, even in our workplaces. I would go to the mall and he would be there. Another department manager told me he'd been reported by four other people over the last two years for very similar behavior. I again went to my store manager, who told me the guy was harmless and maybe had a little bit of a crush. He was in his 50s, and I was 18 or 19 during all this shit. A week later, I gave my notice and quit. He still works there, 13 years later. Still gives me the heebie-jeebies. During my first and only semester of college, my very good friend Jake was dating this girl Stacy that we knew in high school. For reference, I'm female, and I was 18 at the time, and now 26. Not many people back in high school didn't like Stacy, and I was one of them. To me, she was the definition of a sketchy person. She was a pathological liar, and not even a good one, as her stories rarely added up and she would constantly contradict herself, sometimes within minutes after she spouted a lie. She was one of those girls that hated drama, yet it always magically seemed to follow her around anywhere she went. She was constantly in and out of relationships through high school, and would go out of her way to prove they were crazy by spreading rumors about them, and getting as much sympathy from everyone around her as she could. She always had to be the center of attention wherever she went. I remember during prom night, she was dancing with her then-boyfriend when he accidentally stepped on her foot while dancing, and she caused a huge scene about how he was physically abusing her. It was painful to watch. There's so much more I could get into about this chick, but in general, she's just an extremely toxic person who nobody should be subjected to be in the presence of. It's worth noting that she had a drug problem that she often tried to hide, and this will come into play later. Anyway, back to the story. Jake and Stacy had a class together, and hit it off rather quickly. Jake was skeptical at first, but when Jake brought up a reputation in high school, Stacy claimed that she was raped by an ex-boyfriend she had, and that's why she acted the way she did, and that she worked on getting better and was fine now. My friend, being incredibly insecure about being single, and being way too trustworthy, believed her and they began dating soon after. The relationship was extremely dysfunctional, and was rampant with emotional abuse and manipulation on her end. But the aspect I want to focus on was her constantly trying to squeeze money out of him, and her aforementioned drug problem. Stacy would constantly ask Jake for small amounts of money here and there, usually ranging between 10 to 20 dollars. Jake didn't mind all that much, as he bought into her story of her struggling financially, so he felt bad. But one day, she asked for $500 to cover her rent, which he refused. She flipped out on him and didn't talk to him until she drunk died him late one night, and began revealing that she was doing drugs, and it was all because of how terrible her life was and that he wasn't helping. I don't know why he didn't break up with her there and then, but the next day they talked it out and made up, and the issue was dropped. Here's where everything finally comes to a head. It was around 10.30ish on a Friday night, and keep in mind they've been dating for nearly two months at this point. I'm chilling in the living room with another friend of mine. We're sitting on the couch bullshitting about stuff going on in our lives when I get a call from Jake. He explained to me that Stacy was hanging out at a friend's house for the day, and asked him if he could come pick her up at around midnight, as the buses in that area stopped running after 8 and she needed to be at work at 9 the next morning. He said sure, and as the time he needed to leave to pick her up drew closer, his mother called him saying she was working overtime and wouldn't be out until midnight, and she had the car. He asked if I could drive with him to go pick Stacy up. Now I'll admit I would have rather left her to her own devices, but he sounded desperate, and he's an amazing friend who would do anything for me, so I did him a solid and told him to start walking over to my house. He gets to my house about 40 minutes later. My friend went back to her house. She lived across the street from me, and Jake and I get in my car. He texts her that he's leaving now, and that I was driving him, to which she replied with the dreaded K. We reached Stacy's friend's house, which was located on the outskirts of a town in a pretty sketchy neighborhood. 
The road was poorly lit, and to my luck, the street light in front of Stacy's friend's house was out. I refused to park in front of there, as I didn't feel comfortable sitting in the dark, so I parked three houses down between two cars under a functional street light. Jake texts Stacy that we're here. She doesn't respond. As we're waiting there, a truck drives by, and I notice about four men in the vehicle. I think it was an Oldsmobile. And they looked like they were looking around for something. At first, I figured maybe they were lost and looking for an address. But this thought was thrown out the window when not even two minutes later, the truck drives by again, and this time slower. The guy on the front passenger seat makes direct eye contact with me as the truck passes my car by. I tell Jake something is definitely wrong, and to call Stacy so we can leave. He agrees and calls her, and it's dead quiet outside so I can hear the conversation. She answers and says, Hey, where are you? We're down the block. Come outside. I'm looking outside, and I don't see your car, she answered back. We're in my friend's car. It's a gray Subaru, Jake said back, and almost immediately after he says that, the phone call drops. Jake just looks at his phone in complete confusion, wondering what the hell is going on. I'm starting to get extremely nervous now, because between both the truck that was circling around before and Stacy's sketchy behavior, I decide something's up. I'm not just going to be a sitting duck and stay parked on the road if shit goes south. I pull out of the spot to drive up in front of the house, and as I'm pulling out, I hear a vehicle loudly in the distance behind us. I look in my rearview mirror to see the truck from before, now turning quickly and driving up the block. I freak out and forward out of the spot, and begin speeding up the block. The truck catches up with me, and Jake yells at me to turn and that they're trying to shoot at the car. To my horror, I look behind me, and the man in the back seat is leaning out the window with a gun in his hand, aiming at our vehicle. I quickly turn and floor it down the road as they struggle to mirror what I did. I made another left turn, narrowly missing an oncoming car, and slammed the gas. Luckily, I'm halfway down the block by the time they turn onto it. I'm surprised I was driving as well as I was at the time. Jake said I looked extremely calm and determined during all of this, but internally I was freaking out. I was worried they were going to run me off the road, or we were going to get a bullet shot through the back of our heads. I made another left turn and drove like a bat out of hell towards the highway. The truck turned onto the block when I was about a block down, but stopped and turned down another when I got close to the highway. I turn onto the highway and merge into the next lane. A few minutes pass with us going back and forth, questioning who those guys were and what they wanted, until Jake gets a phone call from Stacy. He picks it up and puts it on speaker, shakenly saying hello. Where are you? I'm fucking waiting for you, she screams. He explains the situation, to which she proceeds to call him a liar and says he's not actually there and was standing her up. Jake loses his shit and screams at her that we almost got killed and calls her out on her bizarre head behavior through all of this. She starts yelling again, but she goes silent and we hear a door quickly open. Someone loudly yells in the background on the phone. They got away! Stacy, where the fuck are you? Silence follows this for a few seconds before she hangs up. Jake and I look at each other. She had something to do with this. Long story short, we spent the entire drive theorizing about why this happened, and we think we may have hit it on the head. Jake brought up her asking for money before, and when she asked for $500, she probably needed the money to pay off a dealer. When she didn't get it, she had to find another way. And we think she set herself to head to that house to pick her up, and those guys who were probably the dealer and his buddies would conveniently show up looking to rob us. Possibly also jacking the car and hoping it would cover her debt. She probably thought Jake was using his car and gave them the description of that, not realizing we were using mine, which might explain why they circled around the block in confusion and why she hung up the phone immediately after Jake gave her a description of my vehicle. She probably called them to update them. I dropped Jake off at his house and went home. I know people say after scary encounters that they're always shaken up and their emotions are running in a million directions, but I was just drained. I felt like I just couldn't feel anything and just wanted to go home and go to bed. 
which is what I immediately did when I got there. I filed a police report the next morning on those guys, and they said they'd look into it, but I never heard anything after I filed the report, so who knows what they've been up to ever since. As far as Stacy goes, our theory was further solidified when Jake saw her in class on Monday, where she approached him and berated him for Friday night, claiming she had walked all the way home and had her phone and wallet stolen by some druggies. Jake basically called her out on the whole night, claiming she set us up to get robbed, to which he denied and called him crazy. He told her they were done, and she yelled and walked back into the room. The druggies were probably the dealer and his friends who robbed her over the debt. To our surprise, she never attempted to contact us again and kept her distance, probably because she knew we were onto her and wanted to keep the heat off her. After I dropped out, I never saw her again, and the last I heard anything about her was from Jake, where he told me she developed a long-distance relationship with some guy online and dropped out halfway through the semester to move to Massachusetts to live with him. As far as I know, that was the last anyone I know ever saw or heard from her. Overall, I'm happy I trusted my instincts and picked up on the fact that something was wrong, as this encounter might have had a different outcome. In hindsight, they most likely weren't going to kill us, but that's easier to say after the fact, because at the time we didn't know what their intentions were, and for all they know, they may have even had more planned than to just rob us. And this was the first of quite a few scary and creepy experiences I've had in my life, and this actually wasn't even the scariest one of them. But that's another story for another time.